identified more victims and plan on more than just the four murder charges filed today. Confirm earlier report of cannibalism. The building was a scene of ghoulish slaughter. A large kettle on the stove which held oil. Viewer discretion is advised. Let's get Todd Fox on so he can rec- uh, talk about his story. You have the floor, Todd. Thanks, Manny. Matt, well... If you go back, bro, um, this story is actually going to be about uh, someone very familiar. um, Because remember we talked about earlier, about maybe last year or the year before, Von Green, Mm -hmm. Skid Row Slasher? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember him. He was from the 1974 period. Uh, Mr. Von Greenwood, uh, which he was terrorizing the city of Los Angeles, the Skid Row area. And, uh, you know, he he racked up quite the kill count uh he had 11 uh total victims out of 12. Uh, the 12th one somehow survived and he almost killed a famous celebrity in the process so uh had it not been for them having a um a uh, random event come up uh, that celebrity would have been home and and we would no longer have many movies by that set celebrity so i'm not going to give it away if you haven't heard it but go back and listen to it if you get a chance it's the von greenwood skid row slasher episode um this one's going to do with him because it's going to be in the same area i know we talk a lot of los angeles but there is just a lot of crazy murders and there's actually two or three other serial killers that i want to profile that are in the la area but we just haven't gotten to them yet. We're trying to like, you know, spread the love around to other states and countries, right? If you want to call it love. Yeah, well, you know what I mean? Like like it's just profile cases from other areas. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so cuz if anything, I mean, we could do we could have done a podcast on just Los Angeles and California in general, you know what I mean? Absolutely cuz you know well that we got plenty of crime out here in this the good old sunshine state. Oh, yeah. I mean, between the 1960s and up until about mid-1990s when DNA really took prevalence, there was a lot of serial killers getting away with a lot of stuff. So, Absolutely. It's unfortunate. So, um, And there's still plenty of – I think there's about two or three that have been never caught, you know, that they suspect that were out there during those times and bodies have just been spread around and they just got away with it. A lot of, a lot of that due to Johnson's, especially oh, yeah. back then. Oh, yeah, plenty of Johnsons, and you know well because, I mean, they never share uh, information. They don't talk to each other, stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah, so let's let's get into the one we're going to talk about <laughs> here, and let's talk about – I know I profiled it in the last episode of, on Skid Row, but we're going to re, re-go over the area of Skid Row, which um, it's about 50 square blocks. Um, but due to the revitalization of downtown, the area where the, some of these murders took place – um, would not be considered Skid Row today because Staples Center um, took over that area, revitalized the area. Um, there's much more condos. It's way safer. They got security. But they have pushed um, south of Los Angeles, at least the downtown part, Skid Row. And it is very a destitute area. It's on the border of East L.A., getting close towards the um, the 10 freeway, the 110 freeway. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of there's a lot of encampments. There's a lot of people outside living in abandoned buildings, living on mm-hmm. the street, literally. Um, you know, it's 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 really really sad. And and uh, you know, my dad took me down there when I was a kid, and was like, "You're gonna wind up here if you don't start turning your grades around." And when I saw some of the stuff just in 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 a day. <laughs> I was like, nope, I'm going to turn Dude, around. Dude, is that a tactic most of our parents think? My mom did the same thing, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it, it's like the most derelict area. I mean, it's not making fun of the area. It's just like, hey, this is a warning. You know, you don't get, you know, you're hanging around the wrong people. I mean, because my dad told me you know, a lot of these people aren't here because they're poor. A lot of them are here because they run away. They get into trouble. They get on drugs. They get into gangs or other stuff like that. And, you know, it just turns you know things even worse because the majority of the people down in skid row are not there because they don't have money it's because of the stuff that's led them there prostitution whatnot Mm -hmm. so it's really sad um so moving on 2019 the last time um that they before covid they took the uh demographics of the area uh consisted of 22 percent of the population down there's white 
39% black or African American descent, uh, 16% Asian, 15% Hispanic, 2% of Native American, the rest are unknown. Um, They're aliens. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 7,000 to 9,000 people are living down there in that area. And it's sort of like that one movie with Will Smith. We talked about it last time where he's going from shelter to shelter with his son. Um, they have some places down there, but not enough to house all those people. And I think it's more than 9,000. There's a lot. Oh, yeah. It's, it's way more than that. And they have a lot. And what's sad, too, over the last, I'd say, 10 to 15 years, I forgot to mention, there's a lot of mental people down there as well mm-hmm. so it's not just drugs and prostitution and and runaways there's a lot of mental people that should be getting help that don't absolutely pay. not to cut you off i remember last time about a few months back i was driving down there and you would think this person was a zombie seriously it was he was just walking stone cold hands out eyes white and just talking to himself in the middle of the street down skate row i'm not making this up low-key freaked me out because i've seen some things but i never saw that oh i know i mean when, yeah. when we went with uh with renee's wedding we went down <laughs> we went down there because they have a fabric district or uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have a suit area just north of there or west of there and um we had to drive through skid row to get there and uh, i was riding in the car with damien and and uh i saw this l- woman on the side of the street when the light turned red and she was starting to take off her shirt and her pants. And I'm like, hey, Damien, you want to see someone get naked? And and then uh, he's like, uh, not really. And I'm like, well, too bad. She's right over there. And and uh, I, I was like, holy crap. And then she got completely naked and just ran through the street and was yelling all kinds of craziness. And I'm like, yeah, man, these people need help, dude. They do. They do. Seriously. Yeah. Well, it, was wasn't, sad. it wasn't funny. It was just like, man, it's just out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you can't. I mean, it, it, it's scary to go down there through the daytime. Imagine nighttime. Mm-hmm. So, um, but church organizations have tried to help out community leaders in solving the homeless problem. Um, but now California and Washington are the leaders in homelessness, and uh, it's not getting any better. Uh, the ones that can move, because there's a lot of disabled ones down there as well. The ones that can uh, get a few, you know, few dollars spare change. They'll take public transportation, and they're kind of smart. They'll ride into the, you know, the outskirts or the um, suburbs, and they'll have a better go at it out there rather than be stuck mm-hmm. in one area, you know, like Skid Row. So, mm-hmm. and these people are forgotten about uh, by Angelinos for the most part. So, you know, again, they're 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 in a tough spot. So there's the breakdown of Skid Row. Um, let's talk about some true crime shall we that's what we're here for right that's what we're here for brother yep so skid row does have establishments in between the derelict areas um there are some restaurants uh 7-elevens um you know cheaper places for people to eat obviously so you have people that actually go down there brave the area at certain times to go to work and uh this would be the case um, in October 23rd, 1978, so already a date. Hey. Yeah, 50-year-old cook Jesse Martinez was walking home from a night's work as a chef. He was not homeless, but just worked just inside the parameters of Skid Row and East Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. On his way home, however, as he passed... A marketplace that was closed for the night uh, it was around 2 a.m. he had done all the cleanup and closed up shop he was a- ambushed and attacked and stabbed multiple times in the chest and the abdomen Oof. he lied in front of the uh, establishment all night uh, because that particular part of the city was very quiet over the overnight so he he laid there, who knows if he was alive or not for a while, but he laid in a pool of his blood until someone in the wee hours of the morning, around 6 or 7 at daybreak, came over and saw and found him lying um, on his back, stabbed to death. Dang. Yeah. Oof. Now, unlike the Skid Row slasher from the story we profiled before, where he would slash the victim's throats, uh, put some of their 
blood that would flow from their neck in paper cups, put it by their bodies, sprinkle a little salt around them, and take off their shoes for some reason and put them by their head. You know, this, this, uh, this person was just stabbed multiple times, specifically in, a, in the chest and in the stomach with a long knife, like a long blade. Oof. Yeah, so it was kind of painful. The person bled out pretty fast. Um, Now, these cases, like I said, this started in 1978. The Skid Row Slasher's reign of terror lasted from 74 to 75, so a good year of his terror Mm. before he was caught. So this is not even four years later. And, yes, there's been, you know, murders down in Skid Row. You know, people get shot or whatever, strangled. Mm -hmm. But this one was a little bit eerie because of the stabbings that took place and all the murder that the Skid Row Slasher had put on the community. Now all of a sudden you have this freak out sort of like it looked personal because of all the stabbing. So at first the LAPD was thinking, okay, this is a, either a random act of violence or they were looking into his background. Like who did he piss off type deal? Mm-hmm. So yeah, this was a, this was not one of those things where the cops um, put this priority either, even though he wasn't a homeless man, you know, being a minority, unfortunately at that time, it also, and he wasn't the most richest minority. If he was, he's obviously walking home late at night from a, from a job. They didn't put too much priority into this one, bro. And that's sad too, man. You know, if you're not prestige enough, you're kind of on the back burner. Yeah. And that that would that would really suck, and, and the city would take some heat from this later on. But unfortunately, I mean, what good is that going to do the person's fam, uh, family? So exactly, yeah. Hey, so, man. oh, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that sucks, dude. Like you're walking home from work, and all of a sudden your life ends just like that, and no one, quote unquote, really cares in, in a sense. Yeah, I think you know? this, this was one of those things where the where the detectives went down there, took a report, saw that there was not really no evidence around. There was no murder weapon. There was no shoe prints. Um, just chalked it up as a random act of violence. Let's move on, Johnson. That type of deal. Pretty much. And, and over there in Skid Row, it ain't, well, probably back then it wasn't that many cameras, if there is any now. No, 1978, there was no camera. So you have no CCTV, yeah. you have no DNA. So That sucks. Yep. So um, with that being said, the Skid Row stabber claimed his second victim just five days later on October 28th, 1978. This man didn't waste no time. At all. 32-year-old Jose Cortez was found stabbed to death in an alleyway. He was a homeless resident of Skid Row. People thought that he was sleeping at first until midday of that afternoon when someone came over and said, hey, man, Jose's been sleeping too long. They rolled him over to see, because he was on his stomach in a Mm -hmm. fetal position. They rolled him over to see that, well, I don't know how to explain this without being a little graphic, but when they rolled him over, a bunch of blood came pouring out. Uh, He was being held in by his shirt and jacket. And it just flowed Ooh. out as they moved him. Uh, he, yeah, he was long dead. He'd been killed hours earlier. And when the cops got there to examine the body, they removed his jacket and shirt to look at the wounds. Mm-hmm. They found a piece of cardboard under his shirt. And when they pulled it out, written in blood, it said Satan. What the heck? Yeah. What the heck? So you got somebody sacrificing real humans. We'll get to that, but he, when they looked at his chest, he had over 40 stab wounds above his stomach. God dang. Yeah. Yo, what the heck? Yep. He was, uh, there was multiple knives used because one of the blades broke off inside of him. Yo, so this person just really just wanted to kill him. No specific reason. He'll have a reason, but when you when you hear about it later, it's not what you think. But ah! <laughs> he he does he does have a reason for doing what he's doing. Yeah, this is low key sounding like Richard Ramirez. Yeah, it's not good, not good so far. Mm. So 
one of the newspapers uh, picked up on it. It wasn't the LA Times, but it was a press telegram. It was another newspaper that's long gone now, but it, had, mm-hmm. it was prevalent back in the day all the way up into the 90s, early 2000s. And um, they would call they, – they put two and two together and say these stabbings were too coincidental to be random acts of violence. They hadn't had any real stabbings down there in a while, maybe one or two a year compared to what happened with um, the Skid Row Slasher. So they named this guy the Skid Row Stabber because the Slasher was already in jail at this point, obviously. Very creative. Yeah. Um, so there was no eyewitnesses, no clues to this one as well. And you know what? The cops did the same thing. They didn't close the book, but they're like, well, let's move on to the next murder because you got nothing on this one. You got to do it in your Johnson voice, man. Oh, yeah. Hey, man, you got no you got no weapons. You got no clues. I'm all out <laughs> of ideas. What about you, Johnson? And he's like, well, uh, anything else going on? There's a car accident off of Whittier. Let's go to car accident. Then. That's all he did. So... So these two, these two young men, you know, again, they're not that old. I mean, fifty-year-old still, I think, has some life to live, obviously. And then, then this, oh, guy, absolutely, this guy down on his luck gets murdered as well. Thirty-two years old only. Damn. So, when do you think his next murder is? Well, he murdered five days later. I'm just gonna up it up a notch and say he murdered within one to three days after. You are correct, sir. Um, that was October 28th. He would strike two days later before Halloween on October 30th. God damn. He ain't wasting no time. Not at all. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Bruce Drake, 46 years old, was found stabbed to death in another alley on South Kohler Street. Um, his favorite piece of jewelry that he wore around his neck was gone, his friend said. He did have family. He was from Skid Row. When his family were notified, they automatically realized that he wasn't wearing his gold chain around his neck. Mm. So that was an, a big clue because then that means now the killer is taking a piece of uh, memorabilia. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like a trophy. Mm-hmm. So again, they, the police now were like, okay... Uh, this might be something because the stab wounds were all over his chest again, over 25 over his chest and multiple around his abdomen. Same thing. So this yeah. guy, this guy's getting stabbed and repeatedly the guy bleeds out. There's just no chance for these people. And they're figuring it's got to be someone overpowering because these guys aren't small dudes. That's what I was wondering. Like, is it just one person or is he working with someone or... Well, they don't know at this point. Mm. I mean, there's no eyewitnesses to any of these murders. Like, whoever's doing this is waiting to see, you know, who's around the area. And if they single somebody out on their own, they're getting mm-hmm. it. Mm. So, as the police were investigating this one, and they actually were looking into it because now it's starting to make the papers a little bit. Five days later... 65-year-old J.P. Henderson was found on the sidewalk just a few blocks away from where Bruce, Bruce, Jake's, or Bruce Drake's murder scene was. So this, Five days later? Yeah, so this was barely November 4th. This is right after Man. Halloween. He's got to have a purpose. I'm just trying to figure it out why. Like, well, I'll ask that question when we get there, and we'll see if you can nail it. All right. Yeah, <laughs> I'll give you a couple <laughs> shots at it since we're down a woman, so <laughs> down a man, a person, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I miss Gabby today. Um, yes, we do. But five days later, and more downtown at this point, because again, Skid Row at this point is closer to Staples Center now. Now, now with that murder scene already took in place with Bruce Drake's, that makes four guys, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if you remember, um, if you remember from the Skid Row Slasher, um, there was two murders. Like he killed two men a year apart at the same entryway of the historic L.A. Library. Remember? Mm-hmm. Well, a third victim is now there, and not Whoa. from the Skid Row Slasher, but this man 
kills a man where two others were found just three years prior. But what happens Whoa. first is this, though, bro. So three Skid Row residents are just down the street trying to stay warm. It's, you know, it's November. It's getting kind of cold in Los Angeles, which is like 50 degrees at night or 40. Something like that. You're not too not too cold, man. <laughs> it ain't snowing. Yeah, but over here in L.A., that's like minus 10 for us. But, you got dang um, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so these, these three gentlemen are staying close to a fire that they made on the street. You know, it's late at night, it's like 1, 2 in the morning. Uh-huh. And... All of a sudden, out of the corner, crossing the street, it's like one of those movies. You know, the lights are fl- flashing at nighttime because no one's driving. Downtown's kind of scarce, and, you know, there's really nobody there. And this dude, you know, comes across the street. Big black guy starts walking towards these three three men. And he starts just talking in a different language almost. They couldn't understand him. Mm. And... They start looking at him a little bit, and he starts looking at them, and he starts to come towards them. He looks about 6'5". He looks like a football player. Dang. And he has his one arm behind his back, and the other arm is pointing at the three men. And the three stood up and looked at each other and like, hey, man, this, you know, we've been approached by other guys. Because some, some of these homeless people get beat up by gang members or just punk kids oh absolutely absolutely yeah so they're standing up like okay well there's three of us if this guy attacks us then screw them all bets are off right mm-hmm. so they stood up and they stood their ground and they said what are you doing what's what's going on fool and then the guy yelled at yelled at the three men and said i am lucifer or luther i kill winos and then he started what? to mumble incoherently and the guys looked at each other, and one of them was drinking a beer, you know, in a paper bag. And he's like, and then he just starts mumbling. He shrugged his shoulders, and he walked on. And one one of the, the homeless men picked up a, a stick and was like, all right, man, you know, I'm going to have to beat this guy. We're going to have to use a weapon because he's huge. Absolutely. But he walks off, and the three men stand their ground, and they watch him. They don't sit down. They wait for him to get out of, out of eyesight, and they're just like, man... So make, let's make sure this guy gets away. Mm-hmm. So as they do that, and I brought up the library, the men go to sit down finally because he's out of, you know, they can't see him anymore. They're out of the danger zone. Yeah. They sit down, and immediately when they sit down, they hear screams. Dang. And so, so they're like, oh, crap. So then they pick up stuff, and they start racing towards the screams because where the screams were is where that man was. And where he walked into. And where he walked into was the entranceway of the library in downtown Los Angeles, which is just a half a block away. There they found their friend David Jones, 39 years old, bleeding heavily from the chest. The man was gone. So right away, one of them picked up uh, or said, hey, I'm going to go call the police. He ran to the nearest payphone. And for all of you young folks out there, a payphone. Oh, yeah. used to- <laughs> <laughs> a payphone used to be one of these things that had like AT and T or City of Bell or whatever it's called, Bell Communications. You actually put absolutely money, you put money into it like a like a candy machine, and you could make a phone call <laughs> before the cell phones. Exactly before cell phones. I know that's uh, going back a ways, but yeah, way back. You're aging yourself, sir. I sure am. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> But uh, these men tried to save their friend. They called 911. The police and paramedics actually made it there pretty quickly. For for being Skid Row in a, in a bad part of town, they got there within minutes. Um, the paramedics ripped open his chest, or not ripped open his chest, but took off his jacket. And he proceeded to lift up his shirt. And as he was struggling to talk, when the police were also asking him, who did this to you? They're trying to get some sort of dying declaration because it didn't look good the man just said i've been stabbed and he lifted up his shirt enough to show his wounds and he passed Mm -hmm. out and died right in front of everybody dang no yeah he died right in front of everybody get broadway tickets at moulin rouge musical.com jesus yo that sucks for the three the three friends because it's like dude that could have been y'all number one and number two you guys were seconds away from 
you know, their friend. Yeah, he was coming up on him. Yeah. Yep. Jesus, man. <sighs> well, it's good that they saw who it was, so I'm sure that uh, the, when the police are there, they'll ask, like, hey, did you guys see anything, right? Oh, yeah. They, they did take a sketch uh, rendition of what the man looked like. They also... They also said, told them what he told them, and they, you know, gave a description of the height and weight and everything, and they were just, you know, upset that this happened again. You know, like another one of their you know, friends passed away. Because mm-hmm. down there, if you if you guys stay alive, you got to make friends. You know, it's, it's better Absolutely. to have more friends than enemies. And this guy was Absolutely. one of their friends, and uh, he was just trying to sleep over there by that. Uh, by that pretty because it is a beautiful library if you've never gone down there if you're ever in los angeles check out the la city library it's a lot safer now but back way in, safer <laughs> back in the day i wouldn't recommend it but uh <laughs> um but this this murder now made five and the police were stretched thin at that time and again they would have been put in priority but that's not a priority taking care of the homeless unfortunately unfortunately so, yeah so um, th- it just continues to get worse because yet another victim was claimed seven days later. Francisco Rodriguez, 57 years old, was found stabbed to death in Skid Row parking lot. Now, here's where, here's where I kind of don't agree with this. Mm-hmm. Yes, I know they're homeless. Yes, we know that they may have issues. They're, you know, they don't have a home. Some of them don't have families. It's this, that, and third. I get all that. At the end of the day, they're still humans. And for the cops to kind of like push it aside, you know you have an active serial killer. Who's to say this person won't start killing, you know, regular, you know, people of residence and stuff like that? Or, you know, like Richard Ramirez going to rob people's homes. Like, they should have took this serious because this is an active serial killer. Oh, I agree. And the same thing happened with the Skid Row Slasher. Spoiler alert. I mean, they didn't really take him seriously until he left mm-hmm. Skid Row and started murdering outside in the suburbs. Absolutely. So this happened here, too. I mean, this is literally you had four days after the last murder. Francisco Rodriguez gets murdered on the 8th of November. So, okay, Rod. yeah, this is the sixth one. Mm. And then you pile up two more. Because on the eleventh, he killed two in one night. What? Just blocks away from each other. Thirty-six-year-old Frank Reed. The next, uh, and then, and then uh, they're calling it the twelfth, but I think it was the same night that he murdered both of them. Frank Reed was killed before the twelfth, somewhere around nine p.m. And they're guesstimating that Augustine Luna, a forty-nine-year-old, was uh, murdered. A couple hours after midnight but some believe that it was before midnight because they were literally found within two blocks of each other man yeah and it was the Come same through. same mo dude M- same mo stab wounds yep same Gosh. and and here's the thing to think about maddie matt when i mean have you ever tried to like cut something like like something kind of thick where you know where even if you're cutting meat you know you're trying to carve meat is if they say hey carve that turkey or carve Oof. that big roast you know what i mean mm-hmm. try carving a, a well done tomahawk steak that thing is <laughs> yeah. it's gonna be hard to do yeah because that's what i mean, that's, a, that's a that's a good comparison because if you think about it a person's body is kind of thick you're going to run into the bone and then obviously the clothes that they're wearing, the time of year that it is, you know, you've got to stab with force. You've got to stab with purpose and you've got to stab with hate or some other motivation and mm-hmm. to make those kinds of wounds that he was inflicting on these people. Is that insane? Like you said, you gotta, you gotta stab with some major force. And if he's six, five, like you said, two hundred some pounds. He must be jamming that knife inside their body, cutting through bones, tissue, and everything, dude. Yep, that sucks. Well, police out of this is what uh, I think of lost count. Like I think like eight, eight bodies yeah, eight, right now. Eight. Yeah, right. Well, eight. They only had one clue, and that clue was remember the chain that was stolen, right? Oh yeah, that's right. 
other than that, they didn't have anything until Frank Reed's body, the 36-year-old who was found before midnight on November 11th, he's, his family and his friends said that he carried around a rare coin from the 1800s that to him was good luck. He kept it on him for good luck. That coin mm. was missing. Mm. So they figured, okay, because most of these men that are stabbed to death, one thing that was always part of the thing that I forgot to bring up was the pant pockets were completely emptied out. Oh, so he he did rummage through their, their hip pockets and stuff. Yeah, but most of these guys don't have nothing but maybe a cigarette or something like that, maybe just a wallet with identification, you know. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't mm-hmm. much that you could look at and be like, oh, shoot, you know. So that's the only thing that they had now is two things were missing. Mm. So, um, but this this one, uh, the, the police, the police had no clue. And now they're starting to devote some people to it. They're starting to say, hey, you know what? We're going to get some uh, undercover, pol- uh, you know, cops dressed as homeless men, which is a good idea. Finally, finally. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, we should try to stop this guy. I don't know, man. Is it in the budget? <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, just nine people in, you know, they were aiming for 10. Yeah. And, and this is what sucks, too, because, again, that was on the 11th slash 12th of November, right? Mm-hmm. Five days later, on the 17th, the hunt was ramped up, but it didn't make any kind of progress because 35 year old native american man named milford fletcher or known on the street as jimmy white buffalo was stabbed to death off of main street in a parking lot he was a well-known transient to the ear to the area he'd lived there about 15 years everybody knew him because the way he dressed and how nice he was he was always although not having many possessions himself would always go out of his way to help those in need This pissed off the Skid Row residents and those that lived around the area to where they started to march and voice their opinions upon City Hall just two days later. Mm. So, again, you're having these unfortunate uh, incidents happening. Now, here's... Did that work? Well, I'll get to that in a second, but... I'm going to rewind a little bit to November 11th because remember that was uh, uh, actually no, yeah, uh, six days prior. And this is what pisses me off too. And this Uh is, we've talked about a lot that police departments never talked to one another back in the day, never shared stories, never said, Hey, I got a case like this in my jurisdiction. Right. Yes. Yes. So the LAPD, Although it's the LAPD, they're under a lot of different jurisdictions. So they don't always mm-hmm. work with each other, even though they're the LAPD. Well, back in the day, anyway. It's a lot better now, but still. Um, still. Yeah. There was an attack by the railroad tracks on the south end of Skid Row. Uh, Joe, oh, true. Yeah, Joe Ramirez, 27, and Ricardo Seja, 24. These are two young guys. They were sleeping next to the railroad tracks, and... They were stabbed a few times, but were able to get away Mm. and fight off the attacker. So he got away, and they also said it was a taller black man, and he crept up on them at night. They were able to get away, and that was not involved or mentioned to the police detectives that were actually working the case until far after the, the case had already been in their minds solved. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Like, come on, guys. Yep. And then they had further evidence. So now that after the people went downtown and marched a bit for a couple days, protested and said that they they wanted police involvement, too many men are dying at the hands of a madman, and they had every right to do what they did. And absolutely, I don't I don't blame them. And back then, they didn't riot. They just protested, you know? And that's their God-given right to do that. So we missed back in the day. Yeah, they they actually used to (laughs) protest the right way. But anyway. Yes. Let's not destroy our community. (laughs) Yeah, that's a different subject. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, um, while this was happening, though, detectives and other police in the bus area of the bus terminal would find a note written on one of the uh, bathrooms at the bus terminal downtown that says, I am Luther, I kill winos and put them out of their misery. So, what the heck, man? Yeah, so now they took pictures of that because they're like, if we ever get this guy writing, maybe we can, you know, get his handwriting and compare it, you know? Mm. So that was that was just uh, four days before the day before Thanksgiving. And so now it's the day before Thanksgiving. The city's sort of in a lull. The protesting stopped. Um, a young detective... And his first year was leaving Parker Center, walking across the street from Parker Center and the downtown building, which is the city hall, which used to be the tallest building in Los Angeles. And he's walking to get to his car, which is parked down the street. Now, he passes a bus stop. And on the bus stop, there was a 45-year-old Frank Garcia, a Skid Row mm-hmm. resident. He looked like he was asleep, so the detective was going to ask him, Hey, buddy, you want a couple dollars? Are you okay? And he goes to touch him, and he's ice cold. He checked for a Oh, pulse, crap. And he's dead. He moves the, the gentleman, and he blood protrudes out of his chest. It just starts... What? Chest. The police are obviously now... And this is this is the thing that pisses me off, too. You had detectives on it. Yes, they did ramp up the investigation. Yes, they were putting more boots on the ground. Yes, the 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 neighborhood and surrounding people were upset. But this would piss me off because this was the wake up call to the Los Angeles PD. Because it looked the newspapers ran wild with this and the news television crews went wild with this because this was the killer taunting the police right in front of their eyes like This man was killed right in front of City Hall and right in front of the downtown police department. I mean, he's on the same street as these people. Yeah. So he's he's really wrapping it up a notch. What do you think about this, man? The balls in this guy, right? Dude. Something's clearly wrong with him mentally, but now it's like, yo, you want a piece of me? Come on, what's up? This dude's... Yeah, so that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's number 11. Mm -hmm. Gosh, and this is what I'm talking about. This is an active serial killer. Yes, I get it. They're homeless. I get all that. You know, I wouldn't even say they're not important because that's not true. Everyone's important. You know, there are probably bigger cases they got to deal with. But still, like, you have to put something you have to do something about this because this oh, yeah. man is clearly killing just for the fun of it and just for the sport of it. And who's to say he won't move up a notch and start killing people in their own homes, raping people. Like there's so many scenarios that could take place and you got to stop someone like this because he's not mentally stable. Yeah. A life's a life. I think police even, you know, to this day still don't respect the homeless or they don't. the, um, the um, prostitutes. You know, a lot of young women, when they go missing, it's just like, oh, you know, she'll come back. She probably moved to another town. She's doing her thing. And, you know, it's unfortunate. I mean, because sometimes I could see it because the police get overwhelmed with these kind of cases. Mm -hmm. Most of the times they find the people. Most of the times the runaways are not that far and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they become a little apathetic. And then we we call them out when stuff like this happens because this is egregious. This shouldn't happen at all. At all, yeah, this is terrible. Um, but this is uh, <clears throat> this would suck, and so the mayor would go bat, you know what, crazy, and start yelling at people like you know one of those uh, movies, you know, with a where the the police captain or the mayor just goes off on like the detective, like Eddie Murphy in that one movie. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, Beverly Hills Cop. A Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. So what happens is now, um, after this murder, the police are all hands on deck. You know, any vacation you guys have, forget it. You guys are working doubles. We're going to find this guy because now it, it's a slap in our face. We look stupid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so now all of a sudden they care. 
Um, so working with people, they're trying to find this guy. And from November, right before freaking Thanksgiving, there is no murders for two months. Wow. Yeah. For two months. What's changed? Well, we'll find out. Oof. But that would all change on January 21st, 1979. So when the cops oh, kind of like slow things down a little bit, 26-year-old Luis Alvarez was found stabbed to death at 415 Harlem Place in downtown Los Angeles. Luis was also not a homeless person, but he lived in Culver City but worked in the area. The see? LAP- yeah. Yeah, see? So the LAPD got smart and detectives began to work the angle of a two-month lull in the murders that had um, been attributed to the murder being locked up probably. Like maybe this dude was arrested while he was while the two months were up. So they put up a, a complete task force. And this is before freaking computers, smartphones, <laughs> and stuff like that. They had to go through file upon file because can you guess how many arrests in just the downtown Los Angeles were made between the months of December and January? Or late Ooh. November, December, January? I'm going to say probably maybe a few hundreds, close to maybe a thousand. Oh, you're way off, buddy. More? <laughs> more, a lot more. <laughs> 10,000. Mm, wrong again, buddy. Here, here, here's what I'll give you. Between the months, or between his last murder and right before Thanksgiving and January, what did I say, 29th or 21st? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There was 43,000 arrests. What? Yeah, in the Los Angeles area. Dang, yo, we ruthless. (laughs) (laughs) That's like in the span of three, what, two and a half months? Two and a half months? months, yeah. You're telling me we average twenty thousand, uh, roughly twenty two hundred twenty two thousand arrests per month. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it's higher now. Oh yeah, yeah, it's probably. Bro, this is the seventies. Yeah, this is nineteen seventy eight, seventy nine. I guess, man. Well, crack was hitting the scene then, so you know, it makes sense. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff going on. So they actually went through all the profiles like in all the cases and in, in all the files about every everyone and anyone who was arrested but they did have the advantage of knowing that it was a black male and also the size and stuff like that so they were able to narrow it down that way and they were trying to look into the person's past to see what he was arrested for mm-hmm. so they were doing their due due, 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 due diligence sorry yes brother <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and they came across a 29-year-old black man by the name of Bobby Joe Maxwell. Yo, that sounds like a football player. Yeah. And uh, if you see a picture of him, you see. You'll know. Ooh. Uh, he was arrested because he was seen by a police officer standing over a 60-year-old intoxicated homeless man with a 10-inch knife. The police officer at gunpoint, along with his partner, told the man to don't stab the person, get off of him, because he was just in the act of about to stab the older man. Oh, so they saved the guy. They saved the guy. Yeah, they they uh, he put down the weapon and they arrested him that night. So he was charged with assault and attempted murder. Mm. So who was jo- Bobby Joe Maxwell? <clears throat> Uh, he was born in January 1950. He was the oldest of six children born to the Maxwell family from a young age. He was in and out of juvenile detention and also jail for robbery in Tennessee. So he grew up in a Tennessee area. Um, he was released on parole after threatening a grocery store clerk with a knife. So that wasn't mm. that wasn't good. And that so was he a, just really he, he just really liked knives. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, he had been in and out of jail. And so by the time he was about 26 years old in 1976, his two of his sisters had moved and got an apartment together in Los Angeles and downtown. And that's mm-hmm. where Bobby Joe had came down and moved to Los Angeles. So that's that was his ticket here to Los Angeles at the age mm-hmm. of 27. So 
Bobby Joe had big dreams. He wanted to be a karate instructor. A lot of karate movies were coming out. He liked the genre. He liked dressing like them. As you'll see in one of his pictures where he's arrested, he's actually wearing a Japanese-influenced shirt, probably got from Koreatown or Chinatown. And um, so he's he wanted to be like a dojo master teaching. You know, he, he got into it and stuff, but he could never come up with the funds, never had a stable job. So he would turn back to a life of crime. And uh, his sisters, you know, had to bail him out a couple times. And uh, he was only working part-time labor jobs because he had his record and everything. So he had also tried to rob these people in, in August of 1978 prior to all the murders. And um, he held them at knife point and he was charged with, you know assault with a deadly weapon and uh there was a kidnapping charge because he was taking them off the street into an alley mm. um, he didn't get but two months for that <laughs> that's a shame <laughs> yeah. he only got two months for that you were about to take a man's life they got you at gunpoint they see the 10 inch blade and they say okay okay johnson book him oh dan will book him for just two months <laughs> Well, no, this was this was the one before the murders. Oh, this is, yeah, that's what I'm saying. This is the one before the murder, right? Yeah, he he got the sixty year old man, right? No, the sixty year old man was uh was was the one after Thanksgiving. Oh, where, where he was arrested and remember there was those two months in between in between there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so basically, what I'm trying to say is, prior to the murders, he mm -hmm. was arrested for that. And was and got out in only two months, and then became homeless because his sisters didn't want him back. And then when after he did all the murders, and then there was that two two month cold uh, period where there was no murders before the last assault. Mm -hmm. He was in jail for assault with a deadly weapon, same thing, without the kidnapping charge. Should have got years, and again only got two months. Is it, do you think it has to do with the fact that he was homeless? It could have been, and it could have been overcrowding too. I'm not sure. It really doesn't say. But regardless, got, that ain't nothing. Yeah, it's nothing for threatening a man's life. Jesus. So that was our judicial man. system back then. It's still kind of it's, it's getting it's it's about the same now. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, then now they don't even prosecute. They're all like, now yeah, they I don't just, even do anything. They're all like, just don't do that again, okay? Please. Exactly. <laughs> What three strikes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get thirty-three strikes. Uh, <laughs> so, um, this was falling into place for the LAPD. They were like, "Oh my gosh, this has got to be our guy." You know, no one else has that kind of background, mm -hmm. and um, so they put him on twenty-four hour surveillance, and they tested. They did come up with a fingerprint of the homeless man that was killed on the bus stop. And they're like, you know what? Let's run his prints. Let's see if his prints, because he, he was incarcerated. We do have his fingerprints and his palm prints on file. And guess what? The palm print matched his. Ooh. So they got him for the 45-year-old on the, on the bus stop bench at City Hall. So with that being said, you know, they're following him around. Uh, they don't want this guy to murder another suspect or another person, obviously. And so they're keeping close ties and they're going to take him down if he's going to do something. So while they find out that he's good for that one murder, they're they're moving in. And they but on one of the last nights that they're surveilling him, they notice that he's going on a long walk. And he's walking from one crime scene that he that someone was murdered to the next. And then he would just mm -hmm. casually start talking to some homeless people and go about his way. And then he'd walk down to another street in another alley and just hang out a bit in the area where he had murdered someone prior. So now they're like, dude, he's basically showing us without knowing it that that he's the guy. So that's they, crazy. Yeah. So they send a team to his sister's house and to where he was living on the street. And they find at his sister's house, which is when they interviewed his sisters, they said, yeah, those are his books. They're satanic books. Are you kidding me? 
Yeah, he had satanic books in his possession. He had various writings of his own. So they were able to compare his writings to the bus stop um, graffiti, and it matched. Mm -hmm. Mm. So you have that. And then uh, they found some knives at his sister's house that he had left behind. And they matched the kind that were used in the stabbings because he used multiple. And when they found his little area with his tent on the street, they found more incriminating uh, clothes with blood stains on them. They found knives, more knives. And they found the missing coin and the chain. Oh, crap. So they, they got him. Signed, sealed, and delivered, right? Signed, sealed, delivered. Book them, Daniel. Yeah, that's let's, it, let's Johnson. More. Put the put the handcuffs on him, sprinkle some crack, and let's close this case, right? Let's close this case, Johnson. <laughs> but no, there's a twist. Stop it. There's a huge twist. So you yes. would you, you would think that this is all over, right? Like it's it a should done, be. It's a done deal. Done deal, bro. They actually arrest him in a movie theater. He goes to watch a movie after he's walking around from crime scene to crime scenes late at night. He goes to watch a movie. The police come in there. He doesn't even flinch. He just puts his hands up, stands up, puts them behind his back. They put the cuffs on him. They walk him out. He doesn't say a damn word. Mm. So usually if you're innocent, you're going to be like, you got the wrong man. What the hell are you doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Like why are you? He never even asked why they arrested him. He knew. Right? Yeah, he knew. So again, I'm going to tell you, Sign, sealed, and deliver, right? It's over. Sign, sealed, deliver. I'm yours. It's over with, right? <laughs> it's over. Book it down. Now. Let's let's close the case. How many years he got? Okay. Well, let's start off with the twist. First twist in this one is he gets arrested in '79. <clears throat> this thing doesn't go to trial till '84. God dang. His lawyers were posturing. The, they were going back and forth with the city. It was a high-profile case at this point because he's got a dozen murders. And it just took forever to get started. And he was maintaining his innocence this entire time. And they were trying to get more evidence because the state felt that their evidence... To me, it seems great. But they think it's weak. What? Yes, they think it's How? weak. How? <laughs> I'll explain. Uh... <laughs> So, <clears throat> during his incarceration, he did have a cellmate. And okay. the cellmate, right before the court date, came forward and said, I'm, a, I'm an informant. I have some information. And okay. he was a convicted uh, felon, 37 years old, was facing life himself, and was trying to get himself some time released from his his uh, time spent there in incarceration. He wanted to get out at some point in his life, and he figured if I turn state's witness, I'll help things out. Mm -hmm. He said that Bobby Joe Maxwell told him that he wished that he wore gloves because that's how he felt he was caught and that he would have never been caught had he worn gloves. So, oh, yeah. So they're like, okay, that's another nail in the coffin. We should have this one. You know, we, we can we can at least pin 11 murders on him, maybe the 12th one too. We don't know if he's done that one. We, we, we have information about the attempted murders, so we got that too. So they're thinking, man, we get, we got, now we got plenty of evidence and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And they were trying to get the death penalty on him. And obviously the death penalty was stopped in California, but they were still trying to at least get him on death row. <clears throat> you know, at life at worst, right? At, at worst. Yeah. So Bobby Joe, uh, he he got sentenced to life for the murders. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, you would think this is the end of the story. Y'all come back now. You here? We'll see you next. <laughs> time, right. <laughs> Wrap it up, man. Wrap it up, Johnson. Right. They already seen the crack <laughs> on him. You know, we've already knocked him out. Oh, it's sprinkled. Yeah, it's sprinkle, man. It's, it's a done deal. It's over with. It's right? a done deal. It's in the oven. Yeah, it's in the oven. <laughs> Chick Hearn is like, the butter's getting hard, you know, all that stuff. Everything jiggling. Yeah. yeah. Not so, my man. Not This so. is stupid. This yeah. is ridiculous. And you will you will not you will be pissed off. Let's just say I'm already pissed. 
And if Gabby was here, she'd be trying to cut wings off left and right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what happened is you do get an appeals process, but usually mm -hmm. it takes a long time. It's 1988 now, and the jailhouse informant is turning state's witness again. But what happens what? is what happens is he's turning state's witness in another case, but on the on the stand admits that he's lying. And that he's a what? And, and yeah, it says that he's a career liar and that he's just trying to save his ass because he doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in prison. So not only does it blow away mm, that mm, case mm. he's testifying in, now it screws up every other case that he's testified about another, you know, because he's 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 pretty much a snitch, but he's pretty now much. he's a lying snitch. So, Bobby Joe's lawyer says, "Okay, I want this appeals process to be to to go through because now I think my my uh, client deserves another shot at um, another or, trial. Yeah, another trial." And this is after 88. They start filing all these petitions. It doesn't go well at first for them, but then it starts to gain momentum. And for some reason, the Innocence Project and a few other organizations start to think that Bobby Joe was a wrongfully accused black man. And ah. they start. And, and again, remember, he's got the souvenirs. He's got the palm print that matches his his hand. Everything. The evidence is pointing to him. And three, the, those three homeless men had a positively identified him in court as well. But the problem is now, the only one left at the retrial is not all there. He's got um, dementia. Mm. One of the other men passed away due to uh, old age. And the other one, they can't find him. They don't know where the hell mm. he is. So now you can't trust the main... The state's main, um, what is it called? Uh, witnesses. Witnesses. Because no one else, because those two men that were stabbed didn't really get a good look like they did. Because they were just trying to run away and save their lives. So now you have no witnesses. And you and you still got the palm print. But that could be a, but what they're going to say, the defense is going to say, well, he was just down in the bus stop. He lived down there. You know, a lot of handprints and palm prints were lifted from that bus stop. That erases that. So now it's just down to the souvenirs. And then so they're like, yeah, but these people really, you know, the, the family identified it. The defense was like, how do you know that's theirs? Wasn't there multiple chains made the same way? Look, I got one here from this store. Or look at this rare coin. I got one here. Oh, they're good. Oh, yeah. They, they took away pretty much everything the prosecution had. Oh, they're good. Yeah. God damn. <laughs> they're very good. God dang, they're good. <laughs> they're That's the good DA. They're very A public good. DA, too, doing that? Oh, man. No, this is one that wants clout. Clout. Mm. Yeah. And is, is thinking, okay, if I get this dude out, I'm going to get every you know rich bastard out there that needs help to pay for my services. And he had the backing of the Innocence Project, and, and all these other people were rallying behind this guy. So that'll take you up to 2017. Get the... No, no. And guess no what? No way. What? Bobby Joe Maxwell was exonerated of every murder. What? what? Yes. Found you, innocent. You know what? No. Yep. Yo, that lawyer is as good as Johnny Cochran. <laughs> yeah. Straight up. There's no bruh. They had no other evidence to to tie him down. Unfortunately, there was no DNA taken. You know? Uh they the there was no fingerprints that they could lift from those knives. Um <sighs> they were stuck, bro. And the story doesn't end there because although all the charges were he was acquitted from and he was exonerated Bobby mm -hmm. Joe's now lawyers and now team of lawyers because now they smell the lawyers smelled blood in the water and they wanted to go after the city and sue the crap out of him because he's been in jail now let's see 79 to 2017 that's what 
Uh, mm, 20, years. no, yeah, 79, 20, 79, 89, 99. Yeah, like uh, 40 some years. Yeah. But see, here's what happened. And here's where a lot of people, this isn't my words, this isn't my words, but the victim's words. He was incarcerated for that m- amount of time, found acquitted, just two weeks before he was officially named and was acquitted of all charges he suffers a massive stroke where he becomes comatose oh wow yeah so he wasn't even able to enjoy his exoneration it was almost it was 38 years i did the math (laughs) there you go i knew it was close to 40 (laughs) i just didn't want to i didn't want to be like 44 it'd be wrong (laughs) somebody be like you guys can't add (laughs) (laughs) um but no, the dude had a massive stroke and or a heart attack, and he was comatose. Like he was, you know, paralyzed on one side of his body. Oh yeah. lord! You know, he was basically on a machine. Mm-hmm. And um, although he was on a machine, his lawyers, like I said, they smelled blood in the water. They got a few other lawyers together, and they were setting up this huge class action lawsuit. And the f- funny thing is, I will say it's funny because the the other people said it too. The victim's family. Um, they were quite happy that he suffered that that stroke, but they were even more happy to realize that if he were to die before it went to court civilly and they weren't able to, you know, um, win the case, the mm-hmm. case couldn't couldn't be finalized. Basically, it couldn't it couldn't go to court. So basically, he died in 2019 due to complications of that stroke in a hospice before it was scheduled to go to court just a month later so his family could not reap the benefits of him being exonerated wow so if you do believe wow. that he was guilty then he got what he deserved if you don't yeah it's effed up you know what i mean it's, it's just you know in the end to me he looks guilty i, I think they right. had enough on him but, you went to his tent. You see all the the mom, uh, the 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 victims' items in his possession or in his you know in his place of living. The palm print. You saw him about to stab somebody with a ten-inch blade. He what? Was, yeah, he was no Cub Scout. Let's just put it to you that way. Exactly, my man. When they arrested him, didn't say anything. You got me. There's nothing, bro. The evidence is there. What the? F- <laughs> wow. I'm pissed off, and it happened in the seventies. Yeah, but it just concluded what four or five years ago, right before COVID. This is crazy. Yeah. So, ah. what do you think? Like, what is you? Do you think that he actually did it? Come on, man. <laughs> well, I mean, because. If you look deeper into the story, people will try to poke holes in it. And like the, like I said, the Innocent Project does do a lot of good for those that have He was doing a lot of poking. We, we <laughs> don't know. There's no need to do poke holes. He did the poking. You saw There was three people who saw him who was mumbling, and they were about to be attacked. They stood their ground. And then seconds later, he hit the corner where they saw him, and someone dies. They see his hand behind his back. Stop it. Mm. yeah and you have it's crazy you have that the handwriting too you know the one that was at the bus station it it matched the writings that he had at his house I mean just too many things added up oh boy and somehow somehow way yeah I feel sorry for the victims like I really do because that's jacked up nobody deserves to be murdered like that nobody deserved to be murdered at all but for no justice for them that sucks yeah and here's here's the worst part so you think you have justice you went to jail <clears throat> or the guy went to jail for it the case is closed you know obviously you'll never I, I hate when they say that oh now the family can move on it's just another level of suffering yeah you got the justice supposedly the guy goes to jail and everything but that doesn't bring back your family member. Now you got to cope in a different way, you know, like, and, and just whatever faith you believe in or, 
you know, you have to take it to another level. And it's so hard to get through something like that. I feel for these families, but then for it to be ripped out, put in court again, years of appeals. And then in the end, bro, he would have won millions from the city. He would have. That's what I'm saying. He would have. Yeah, he would have won millions and he was a killer. And then on top of that, all those families, those cases are technically reopened. They're and that's what I'm talking They're unsolved. And, and, this, and this is what, not to cut you off, this is what annoyed me. Yes, he served time, but he is, he's cleared of that. Mm -hmm. Like, the, it, in the records, it says basically those cases are open. Like, there's no, no one to be uh, charged for that. And it's like, come on now. Why, yeah. what, what are we doing? And that's so sad. I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, that's 12 people at least that, you know, you don't you don't have a conclusion to their story. You know what I mean? Like like it's technically left open. Maybe the family's like, well, we know the person that went to it. But if you look it up, it's like, no, it's unsolved. Why'd they give him a pass? Yeah. I mean, think about this, too, Matty. Matt, the killing started when he came to town. Yes. The killings ended when he was finally arrested. There was never yes. there was never any killings comparable to that one to any of those after that period. So it's it should be an open and shut Johnson case. Absolutely. <laughs> you know they say, you know, back then we didn't get away with murder, you know, especially being a black person. He get he did with this one. Yeah, he did. But, you know, whether you believe in karma, what goes around comes around, he wasn't able to enjoy it, and he never got any money out of it. At least those two things happened because, I mean, imagine if that dude is still alive, you know, I mean, because he's born in 50, so he, today he would be about, what, 73? Mm -hmm. So if he, if he was, he'd still be pretty spry. I mean, my dad's 80 and pretty spry for himself, so being 73 years old, he'd be able to rub it in people's faces and be a millionaire at this point. Yeah. It's... That sucks, man. I, I feel bad for the victims. You know, this, this guy didn't deserve to take any of their lives. Who is he to take someone's life? And then, yeah, like I said, he did go to jail. He was in jail, but he's cleared. Is that if he's, a, you know, if he was still alive, he would have been free of all. And then on top of that, he was going to get rewarded. What? Yeah. I mean, it's widely assumed that he was the guy. And I think a lot of, like, he, he is listed as one of the, you know, the city's worst serial killers. But it's one of those ones with an asterisk because he was exonerated, you know. But, I mean, the majority of people would be like, no, nah, no, nah, he's guilty. And it was weird, too, because that was another pattern that the police couldn't pick up. He was killing um, residents of all races you know men yeah. of all races he wasn't just attacking whites or latinos i mean he, he was killing them all yeah so i mean this was a tough case like i the more and more i did investigating into it i was like holy crap dude like <laughs> i i thought for i thought for the uh, you know until i got to the end of it i was like oh this dude's gonna be fried just like von greenwood like he's probably in jail with him you know like you know mm -hmm. they're both skid roll murderers yeah. Nope. Not today, sir. Not today. Wow. This one sucks. This one sucks. You know. Um, you know, he look, he, he passed away. Um, nothing we can do about that. It's just the simple fact that they 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 cleared his name. And those victims technically are the justice is not served because now it basically says that no one is convicted of those those murders. It's it's open case. So they're they're essentially their murder is still unsolved. Correct. And essentially there's no justice for their murders. Correct. And that's what sucks. It does suck. You know? And and one other thing I'll add to this is with all the violence that happened between the years of nineteen seventy four with Von Greenwood and leading into 1979 with Bobby Joe, um, I forgot his last name, uh, um, uh, Maxwell. Maxwell, there you go. 
<clears throat> um, you would think this would bring awareness down to Skid Row, and it really didn't. Because if you remember in the early 80s, just a couple years later, 81, 82 even, that's when the Richard Ramirez stuff started, and he started uh -huh. down there in the Skid Row area. Um, so that area has never really learned or moved on to better and bigger things. And at times there still is murderers down there. Um, so again, if you're in the Los Angeles area, please do not make a wrong turn towards um, Skid Row. It's, it's not a fun place. It's not, and we're not trying to scare you. It's not like you're going to drive down there and then boom, you're dead or anything like that. But it's just, it's just, you just definitely got to be careful over there because it is a sight to see. And if you are someone who's very, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Nervous or, you know, kind of paranoid and stuff like that, or gets really scared, it might not be a safe area for you because some people can feed off of fear and they might try to take advantage of you of that. And you will still stand out as a, um, what is it called, a vacationer or as a tourist. Tourist. So if you're daring enough to go down there, make sure you have something to give them. And even if then, I mean, you might get mobbed if they see you coming down there. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is a tough place to be, and like I said, in the daytime. And again, yeah, like Matt said, it's not like a war zone or nothing. It's just your, your chances of being assaulted or robbed or just some, seeing something scary or something you don't want to see goes way up down there. So absolutely. Yeah. But that's a, that's a sad fact of life. And uh, Skid Row has been around since what the market crash, uh, the, the great depression. So it's been around for Dang, that, that, that long. Yeah. It's almost a hundred years. Yee. Yeah. So, but that's my story for tonight, my man. Well, thank you, Taz Fox, for breaking down that story for us and the audience. We appreciate that, man. Not a good conclusion that we wish happened, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm.